Good morning and welcome to Birmingham Unitarian Church. I'm the Reverend Mandy Beal. I'm this congregation's senior minister. I'm joined in worship leadership this morning by our co-directors of music ministry, Abha and Stephen Deering. We also have very gratefully communication support from our communications coordinator, Sarah Constantakis, as well as our Zoom greeter, Jane O'Neill. And we also have with us worship associate, Donna Larkin Moore, who happens to also be our board president. BUC is a Unitarian Universalist congregation located in Bloomfield Hills, Michigan. Even in our virtual format, we are a thriving community with a place for everyone. Social justice is an, an essential component of our church life. We are a green sanctuary congregation. That's a designation that we've earned for our dedication to caring for our planet. We're also a capital W welcoming congregation. Our social justice work this year is focused on environmental action, economic inequality, civic engagement, and racial justice. Our worship services are hosted here on Zoom every Sunday morning at 1030. They're later posted to our website as well as our Facebook page. After the service, we invite you to stay for a virtual coffee hour, especially if you're here with us for the first time this morning. Because we are a thriving community, we have four announcements this morning. First, it's Bake Off time. Who doesn't love Bake Off? Bake Off is a time-honored tradition that benefits our religious education program. This year's choices include $10 per dozen fan favorites, your traditionals like sugar cookies, as well as $20 per dozen mystery bakes. And if you don't want any treats, but still want to support our RE, our, our RE program, you guys, it's gonna be fine. It's going to be fine. <laughs> you can, for $5, send a caring card on your behalf to brighten another BUCers day. You can also just donate money. All of the baked goods will be available for pickup next Sunday between two and four in the church parking lot. Bake off orders must be received by this Wednesday. It's a hard deadline. This Wednesday at 10, you can place your orders using the blue bake off button on our website. Secondly, the membership committee welcomes everyone to another series of getting to know Unitarian Universalism, which starts today, right after the service and coffee hour at noon. Getting to know UU is great for newcomers, people who are considering membership, and anyone interested in learning more about their own beliefs, as well as the beliefs of other people in our faith and our community. This is a interactive, introspective, informative and fun set of four non-sequential classes that are adapted from the in-person course. We'll end coffee hour today at 1145 so we can start class at noon. If you want to join that class, you'll use a different Zoom link than the one that you're already using for this service. You can find that link on our calendar. Third, also from the very busy membership committee, join us this Saturday for our second Midwinter Mixer and Game Night. Let's start the month off with a fun-filled evening of icebreakers and the game Kahoot. We'll laugh and connect and then viciously compete for fun prizes. We hope to see you on Saturday at seven. That Zoom link is also in the calendar. And last, I want to draw your attention to the upcoming UUA conference called New Day Rising. Here's the description. Is your congregation ready to take a new step in changing white supremacy culture? Want to learn what your fellow congregations are working on and how you might apply it at home? Join a continent of UUs as we explore next steps in creating beloved UU communities. The conference is on February 27th. There is a $30 registration fee. Financial support is available. We'll be sending more information in an email later this week. Thank you for joining us this morning or whenever you're watching this. Although we are not together physically, we are together in spirit and it's good to be together again. And with that, our service will begin. This morning's prelude is in honor of Black History Month. And uh, what we're gonna play is the first section of a rag by Scott Joplin, who's known as the King of Rag. He was born to the son of ex-slaves, former slaves in an area called Texarkana, Unity. Um, he learned the piano while his, starting at the age of four while his mother cleaned the homes of the wealthy and was taken under the wing by local musicians who taught him formal theory, gave him formal piano lessons. He supported himself by teaching guitar and violin. 
I chose this one to transcribe from piano um, because it's called the original rags and it was it's thought to be entitled so because he was being plagiarized by white folks, white composers. We worship in our separate homes this morning, but we are joined with a multitude of Unitarian Universalists enlightening our chalice. We light this chalice as a symbol of our dedication to growth and healing. May its light guide our way as we find new paths to the heart of our living tradition. Our first hymn this morning is number 323, Break Not the Circle. Michael Doral wrote, Paul Wilkes is a religion editor of the New York Times and author of numerous books about religion in America. In his book on congregations, he writes, religion should be a great adventure and not a leisure activity. He believes churches should be called to do things they think they cannot do and should stick their necks out and take chances. Numerous church observers believe that in the coming decades, one third or more of all churches in the United States will close their doors. Among the churches closing, maybe 400 to 500 of the 1,000 UU congregations. Today, people have powerful problems and seek a powerful faith. We have the talent and the financial means to create such a church. However, the jury is still out on whether we will empower clergy and lay people to lead us in that direction. Churches seldom die from taking risks. They expire from becoming complacent. A friend of mine recently said, 
Religion requires guts. Unitarian universalism should be creating churches that make the world a more just, safe, and equitable place. This goal will not be accomplished if church leaders believe their primary role is to accommodate the people who are already there. As a faith, we are beginning to make significant changes related to race, racism, anti-racism, and the changes in the way we involve, support, and accept leadership from indigenous people. Change is the name of the new game, the new way of being a Unitarian Universalist. Powerful words of prophecy that we all need to hear. And the mission of this Unitarian Universalist Church is to create a welcoming religious community that encourages lives of integrity, learning, service, and joy. The weekly offering serves as an ongoing reminder of this mission. It's your weekly re-upping that this is the way that you want to live your life. Sharing in the weekly practice of generosity also strengthens the bonds between congregants and this high purpose. So let there be an offering in support of the good works of this beloved community. Contributions can be made through our website, through Venmo with username at BUCMI, or you can put a check in the mail. However you choose to give, we ask that you do so with a heart of gratitude and service for each other. Our offertory song this morning is for you folks, all of you folks, but especially those who love music from the 1990s. You'll remember the song recorded by the band Oasis in 1994. The chorus is really easy, so please sing with us on it. turn our attention now to spiritual practices, centering, grounding, focusing. We start with the sharing of joys and sorrows from our congregation. And for this time in the service, we do pause our recording for a greater sense of privacy. We gather this morning as a worshiping community dedicated to understanding more about ourselves, each other, and life's big questions. We gather in the face of a time that is changing, a time that is confusing, that is calling us to do things that we don't know how to do around being more inclusive and more welcoming. 
This requires us to turn a critical eye to ourselves and to our history. And in, the, in light of that, may we hold each other in accountability, but may we do so in love. May we find ways to be gentle with ourselves while also fiercely determined to move forward in a spirit of greater openness, inclusion, and anti-racism, bringing all of us together into the future that we dream about as Unitarian Universalists. May it be so. Amen. And blessed be. Today's reading is from Parisa Parza. It's the right of conscience, not the right of ego, that we preserve in our fifth principle. The distinction is important. A. Powell Davies, the great visionary and activist, Unitarian minister of the mid 20th century, called conscience the sight of the soul. The soul being that innermost part of each person that yearns to move toward greater insight and wholeness. Our conscious is not something that is directed by a God who acts outside of us, but the emanation of a God dwelling deeply within us. Brahman, Buddha nature, spirit of life, Jehovah, call it what you will. It is an undeniable part of humanity and sometimes deeply hidden, other times sorely stifled, but always there to be recognized and cultivated. The inner point of connection that speaks to us in stillness is our compass and our guide when the rules of the human world are broken or have become abhorrent. That place in us that affirms life and love in all their glory and messiness is where we must return if our conscience, our soul is to flourish. Everyone who has lived with other people knows that we can commit to a community and then find ourselves at odds with the community's decisions. The ego is tempted to rail against the community and even to stomp away in anger. Ego freedom lets us walk away in a huff, but freedom of conscience, having already committed to a life of accountability to this community, demands fidelity even in disagreement. A community to whom we have connected ourselves must be offered the same respect we demand from the community. The opportunity to hear our objection, fear, or pain, and to respond to it according to the dictates of the communal bonds. In a healthy community, each individual among us should occasionally be in the minority. The experience promotes spiritual growth, maturity, and a deepened understanding of the cost and the rewards of community. 
it reminds us of our need for God and what is asked of us if we are truly to be a people of God. I used to believe that my own freedom was too precious to be stifled by the challenges of those who disagreed. My confidence in my own way and deeper still, my fear that I could not be worthy of the deep connection of abiding community where the one, two punch that had me step out soon after stepping into a new community or worse, staying on the fringes joining in name, but not risking too much. It's tempting to pick and choose the more attractive parts of what is offered in community and lie low when the more demanding tasks need attention. And it's easy to get discouraged and then walk away disappointed and righteous. The Puritans demanded evidence of an experience of grace as requisite for entry into the religious community. They understood that we are not really ready to be in full community with others religiously until we have had at least one experience of conversion. They would have put it in terms of conversion to the acceptance of Jesus Christ. I would put it as a witness to turn one's heart, one's conscience to that place in others where God dwells. It is the turning of one's heart toward rather than away from connection with others, the opening and the willingness to be vulnerable that comes of the deepening life of faith. Religiously, our commitment to the democratic process asks us to bring our piece of revelation, our knowledge of grace, into relationship with others in the place where God dwells in them. It invites us to live communally from that kind of openness. Those words come from an essay on the fifth principle of Unitarian Universalism from a book called The Seven Principles in Word and Worship that was written by Parisa Parsas, as Donna said when she read that. Our worship theme this month is devout Unitarian Universalism, and I'm so excited, I'm so excited. <laughs> this, is, this is gonna be a great month. When we come to this month, we ask ourselves, what does it mean to pursue our religious ends, the ends of Unitarian Universalism with devotion? And we'll start today with an exploration of living by our seven principles, specifically our fifth principle. The seven principles are one of the most well-known parts of Unitarian Universalism. Those seven principles, seven principles are our foundational covenant. They are a set of aspirational statements of how we want to live in our congregations and also in the world. They're not a statement of belief. They are an agreement of how we will treat each other, how we will behave. When you cast your lot with a UU congregation, you become a part of the covenant of those seven principles. And that is why I very explicitly ask people if they agree to that covenant when they join our church. It's not a gatekeeping mechanism. It's not a test of faith. It's a way of making sure that everybody knows what they're buying into and they understand what's expected of them in our church. There is no test of faith or any faith requirement to be a UU. But our religious tradition has a shape. There are defining characteristics and there are things that we have in common. There is no limitation on what we can believe, but there are limits placed on our behavior. And those limits are spelled out in our seven principles. We know ourselves to be you use because of our covenants. Or it can be said that those covenants are how we do Unitarian Universalism and fidelity to those covenants is one of the ways in which we are devout Unitarian Universalists. We are who we are because of how we are. UUs are compelled to find our own answers to life's big questions and covenants give us the structure that we need to do that work. But 
as it says in the gospel according to Spider-Man, with great power comes great responsibility. And what if someone decides that their best path to God or to ultimate truth is swatting people on the nose? It's not okay to hurt other people and to justify it as your right to your own beliefs. And that's where the fifth principle comes in. Here's our fifth principle in its entirety. We, the member congregations of the Unitarian Universalist Association, do covenant and affirm to promote the right to conscience and the use of the democratic process within our congregations and in society at large. This is currently my favorite principle because of how much we need it to navigate this cultural moment. It speaks to the tension that we hold between individualism and group health. There's a reason that the right to conscience and the democratic process appear in the same principles. It creates an elegant balance between the two, between I'm free to do whatever I want and also when you do whatever you want, sometimes it impacts people. And it must be said that the appeal of Unitarian Universalism for many of us is our freedom. A lot of us come to Unitarian Universalism from other religious traditions that were oppressive, restrictive, or even downright abusive. And when we find our way here, there's, there's this moment when we realize, I really can believe whatever I want and I really can be who I am. And that moment is precious. And it is right and good to cherish the freedom that we find here. And yet, and yet, for that freedom to be real for everyone, we must accept limits on our freedom. There's no nose swatting. Now, I use the example of nose swatting to be a little light and to provide an easily accessible illustration of the limits that we have to accept in order to have a healthy community. But the ways that we can cause harm to each other are much more serious and insidious. And at the beginning of Black History Month, it's appropriate for us to be frank about the history of white supremacy culture and Unitarian Universalism. And when I say white supremacy culture, I mean the bias that white culture is the correct or the default culture of our nation. From this follows the belief that cultural expressions that fall outside of the standards of whiteness are inferior, incorrect, or disruptive. American cultural institutions, all, find, all founded by white people, are rooted in and shore up white culture as the default American culture. And so we are steeped in this bias. That's true for all Americans, but white Americans are often unaware of that bias. An unexamined bias leads to unintentional racist behavior which causes just as much harm as intentional racist behavior. That lack of awareness of un unexamined bias exists in predominantly and historically white institutions as much as it exists in individual white people. That includes Unitarian Universalism. The Unitarian Universalist Association was founded in 1961 through the merger of the Unitarians and the Universalists. Both were Christian denominations and both were almost exclusively intentionally white. We are an institution founded by white people who believe their culture to be superior to others. And that assumption has been woven into our tradition and remains there today, although we don't really often notice it. By we, I mean white people. But we're starting to notice it. The awareness of UU white bias has grown dramatically in the past five years. This was prompted by some internal hiring issues, we'll call them, that brought UU racial bias into sharp focus and it coincided with the movement for Black Lives. These two forces have held a mirror to our bias, the bias that many white people don't even know that we have. And the confrontation with that bias has spurred us to action. And since that time, our churches and our association have entered a period of rapid change and growth about how we talk about and how we understand race. Uncovering the painful history of white supremacy culture in our tradition has been a very difficult process and not everybody is on board for it. You use like to believe 
that we are a justice-seeking, justice-making people. Or at the very least, we like to believe that we don't cause any harm. However, we tend to think of and speak of race as if it exists somewhere else. And that causes harm, unintentional, but harm nonetheless. In our churches, we tend to talk about how social identities don't matter because we're all just people. And then we look around our congregations with a deep sigh, wondering why more people of color don't join us. And then we tell ourselves that they, people of color, just don't know about us, or it's because there's a lack of public transportation or, or because they prefer a more animated worship style. I've heard those words in many of the UU churches where I've worked, including ours. And it's time that we move away from these assumptions about other people's behavior and we take a critical eye to our own behavior. As race talk has both shifted and become more prevalent in Unitarian Universalism, there has been pushback, sometimes strident pushback. Talking about race is uncomfortable and talking about race in our churches is new. At least talking about our own complicity and complacency in racism is new for us. One of the tactics that white people use to avoid the discomfort of examining racial bias is denial. These are the lines like, I don't see color, or we're not racist, we're just doing church according to our traditions, or I don't use racist language. As you, you lay people and religious professionals of color have continued to hold white UUs accountable and the system of Unitarian Universalism more accountable, it has become increasingly difficult to slip out of that accountability using those lines of denial. And when those mechanisms are no longer effective, some white UUs have reacted with anger. And many of those angry white UUs have a platform and they use the fifth principle as their justification for not accepting the newer ways of talking about race. They claim I have the right to conscience and so I can't be told what to do. It is in the name of the right to conscience that, the, conscience that they refuse to use the language that our siblings of color have asked us to use, especially the phrase white supremacy culture. I understand that that phrase can be startling when we first hear it, but if our siblings of color are asking us to use that term, can't we just be curious about it? and ask why instead of being defensive and resort to you use can do what we want, right to conscience. You don't have the right to do whatever you want. You have the right to believe whatever feels real and true to you. You have the right to freedom of belief, not behavior. Your right to do whatever you want only goes so far as it allows others to thrive in the same space. And sure, technically you can do whatever you want, but actions have consequences. To hold up the fifth principle as protection from accountability is a distortion of that principle. As Parisa Parsa wrote, it is the right to conscience, not the right to ego that is ensconced in that principle. And again, there is a reason that the right to conscience is coupled with the democratic process. If the majority of us want to go in a certain direction, that's the direction that we're going to go. Hopefully, we can all go there together. Anti-racism work is the future of Unitarian Universalism. It is the future of how we keep half of our churches from closing as is predicted, and it is the future of Birmingham Unitarian Church. And as they say, the future is now. Anti-racist, anti-oppressive, multicultural work is how we stay relevant in a rapidly changing culture. This is a pivotal moment in the history of our nation and our religious tradition. We get to decide whether we're going to move with the times or whether we're going to defend our choice not to. Is it defensible to choose not to grow? Is it defensible to choose 
to risk our religious tradition because we're unwilling to have difficult conversations. The work of dismantling racism is not easy, it's messy, and we're all going to make mistakes and we're all going to feel uncomfortable sometimes, but we have to do it. Not because someone is making us do it, but because we care about each other enough to do it. Love is calling us to new ways of thinking and talking about race in church. We answer the call of love. The outcomes of our actions and our history are being lifted up for us to see. And if we can't or we won't accept responsibility for the images that are being left up, lifted up, it has nothing to do with the right to conscience. That's about the right to comfort. The right to conscience requires us to be challenged, which in turn requires us to grow and to change. We're being asked to grow. And if we choose not to, let's not call that the right to conscience. Let's call that what it is. That's the right to ignorance and arrogance. Our fifth principle strikes the balance between our Unitarian heritage of self-improvement and our universalist heritage of social concern. Undertaking explicitly anti-racist work in our congregations is how we join the two in the current moment. We can be better and we can love more. Our seven principles describe a world without oppression. That's what we aspire to do and to be. We are who we are because of how we are. And that's how we wanna be. That's the dream to which we have devoted ourselves. And creating that world, that is an act of devout Unitarian Universalism. May it be so. Our closing hymn today is number 298, Wake Now My Senses. We'll do verses 2, 4, and 5. <laughs> So go now out into the world and take with you some of the hope and the love and the joy that you've heard here. Let's bring a critical eye to our behavior. Let's consider what it is to love more, to be more, to take greater care of each other. May it be so. Amen. And blessed be.